I'm glad you are here this morning. Good looking crowd. Look at the person next to you and say, you're so good looking. <laughs> Amen. And if they're not, you have special permission to go ahead and lie about it. There you go. We've been in a series called This We Know, and uh, the title of the message this week is God is Three in One. God is Three in One. And I know some of you are probably wondering why you're preaching on that. Uh, you'll understand, hopefully, a little bit better later on. But go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, and let's look at verses 8 and 9. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Have you ever in your life tried to figure out God? Have you ever asked God why? You say, God, it doesn't make sense the way you are doing it, so let me instruct you. Have you ever done that? You know, sometimes we want to tell God how to run this world, how to run the planet. You know, God says right here at the beginning, he's saying, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not like your ways. you got your way of doing things, but I've got my way. You've got your way of understanding, and my way is far higher than yours. It says in verse 9, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than than your thoughts. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning as we study your word that we'll be excited and enthused and challenged by what we hear. Lord, knowing that our salvation before the foundation of the world was already planned and, and you orchestrated everything to bring us to that moment where we cried out and asked Jesus to save us. God, I thank you that your spirit is still at work today in this world. And Lord, I pray that we'll understand that and we'll create boldness in our hearts as Christians to be the witnesses that you've called us to be and the examples that you want us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Some of you will have a hard time believing this. But when I was a kid, many of the sitcoms were in black and white. I know. You can't hardly believe it, can you? Father Knows Best, my favorite, Leave It to Beaver. And the early I Love Lucy show, black and white. Remember that? And Lucy was always good and always funny. Well, I, I ran across an article about uh, her hometown wanted to honor her because she's the biggest uh, celebrity that's ever heralded from that particular town. So they wanted to honor Lucille Ball. And so they commissioned that a statue be made to honor her, and they put it in the middle of their little tiny park there in that particular community. And then they had the day that they unveiled it to show everyone this new statue. And when the people saw it, they were aghast. They hated it. They wanted it gone. In fact, they even started a Facebook page, remove this statue immediately. Why? Well, look at it and see if this looks like Lucy to you. <laughs> They nicknamed it Scary Lucy. <laughs> now, if you're going to make something like a statue, shouldn't that at least look like the person that, that you're, you're trying to make? Yeah, it should, you know. Well, we don't want any Scary Lucys around here. If, it's, if we're going to have something, call ourselves something, and try to imitate someone, we ought to at least, at least look like that which we are trying to imitate. So let me ask you this question. Who is the church supposed to look like? Jesus. 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 In fact, uh, there are two aspects of that word Christianity. We all know that it means to be Christ-like, but it also means to be little Christ. We're supposed to be like Jesus. We're never going to be Jesus. And I've heard some guys on television say, you're a little Jesus. No, we're not. But we're supposed to be Christ-like, like little Jesuses. We're supposed to be like him. Not only individually, but corporately as well. Have you ever done anything that uh, after you did it, you thought, well, that didn't look very much like Jesus? Am I the only sinner here? I remember when Robin and I bought our first little house, little two-bedroom house. Might have been a 1,000 square feet. I, I don't know if it was that big. It was small. And uh, in her kitchen, you know, we didn't have a dishwasher. Well, I guess we did. His name was Robin. <laughs> I know I'm a male chauvinist pig. You know? 
So I, I went down to Sears and I bought a dishwasher and we set a date for it to be delivered and installed and I had torn out some cabinets and I built a place for it to, to be installed there. And uh, so the day came that it was going to be installed. I took off work that morning and they didn't show up and they didn't show up that afternoon. And by late that afternoon, I was pretty ticked off in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I called them up and I said, I can't believe you guys did this. And I took off work and, and man, I just blessed them out. I did. I just was, I, I was un, ungodly. I'm just going to admit it. I was, I know that you can't hardly believe that, but I was. <laughs> well, sir, we can, we can deliver it tomorrow afternoon. We'll make sure it gets there tomorrow afternoon. I said, well, all right, you better be here. I'll take off work again. Be here at two o'clock or whatever. And so, um, that afternoon, the old, or that morning, rather, I opened up the paper and and lo and behold, the very same dishwasher that I had just bought was on sale for $100 off. So I called them again. Had a completely different tone. Do you think you could give me that sale price since it hasn't been delivered yet? Yes, sir, we'll do that for you, you know. I was very much like Jesus that second call. You know. Yeah, it's amazing how often when you're not very much like Jesus, it comes back to bite you. Have you ever had that happen? I mean, it comes back to haunt you. It comes back to bite you, and, you know, that's never a good thing. But not only are we supposed to look like Jesus individually, we're supposed to look like him corporately as a church. All of us together with the different spiritual gifts that God has given to us should paint the image, should paint the picture of Jesus to this community so that when this community thinks of Spring Baptist Church, they think about Jesus. Isn't that what it's supposed to be like? That's a church that's Christ-like. Is a reputation we want to have in this community. But what does it mean to, to look like Jesus? Well, it means that we reflect His nature. Is the nature of God a nature of hate? No. Is it one of love? Yeah. Kindness and joy and peace and all of those things, that's the nature of God. Is that, and we're supposed to take his character and demonstrate the character of God to those that we come in contact with. And we're supposed to implement the actions of Christ. So when we're walking with God, we know God in a better way, which gives us the tools and the power to be more like Jesus, right? And to implement, what, what would Jesus do? You remember the bracelets everybody used to wear, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Do we still ask that question of ourselves in a scenario, in a situation, in a relationship? What would Jesus do? How would he handle this? That should be a question that we always ask. And why do we want to be like that? Because we don't want to be known as scary church. Right? We don't want to be like scary Lucy. We don't want to be scary church. We, we don't want people to think of Spring Baptist Church and say, you know, that's a church, and they're just not very friendly. They're not. Now, on occasion, it's rare, but on occasion, there's sometimes that people visit here, and we follow up on that visit. And, and I'm talking about maybe a couple of times a year, and they say, you know what, not one person in church spoke to me. Not one. Should that be the testimony of any church? Now, it's possible if someone just comes for worship service and they don't go to a small group. I, I can see how that could possibly happen. But when you, we're creatures of habit, and pretty much all of you sit in the same areas every Sunday, and I happen to know where you sit. <laughs> I've got a photographic memory. I just don't have any film. <laughs> you know? But if you see someone you don't know in your area, don't be bashful about it. Turn around and say, man, we're glad you're here. What's your name? And you say, but what if it turns out that they've been members for 38 years? It doesn't matter. You just met a new friend, right? And they met you. So let's make sure that we're on top of that and they're always kind and friendly because if we're not, then we're scary church. We're scary church. But it goes beyond just being friendly. There are churches that have a reputation of being utterly ungodly. You know? There was a, a church uh, in Oklahoma named Grace Mott Church. And it turned out that three or four of their staff members were cheating on their spouses. And so people started calling that church Gross Mott. It doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, it was the death knell of that church when all that became public. But there are church members that don't act very 
godly. There are church staff that don't, and there's sometimes church members that don't act very godly to the community. And so we've got to be friendly, and we've got to be godly, and people have to see the reflection of the character of God in our everyday life when we get outside these four walls. Because you know how we are when we get in these four walls. We walk around and say, how are you doing today, brother? We all turn to an evangelist, don't we? What's going on, sister? Has God blessed in your life, my brother? You know, that's what we do. But what do you do when you're at work? What do you do when you're at school? What do you do with your neighbors? See, well, shouldn't we reflect Jesus in all of those places as well? And, of course, we all know the answer to that is what, church? Yes. yes. Now, here's the problem we have with the Trinity. Our view of God is limited. We have an unlimited God, and we try to figure him out, but our view of God on this side of heaven is always going to be a limited view. It's very narrow. It's incomplete. We're never going to completely know God. And let me say something about that. If I could completely understand God, he would not be much of a God at all, would he? If I could wrap my mind around the, the thoughts and the ways of God and understand everything he does, he would not be God at all. So today we look at the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Let's try that. God the, Father, God the, Son, and God the, Holy Spirit. you see, it's one of the most important doctrines of Christianity. We need to understand at least the best that we can. And, and I'm going to use some illustrations today, and I'll, I'll tell you right up front, none of them are going to really be sufficient. None of them. I, I'll do my best as we look at verses and scriptures and passages that try to describe the Trinity of God, but I'll tell you it's not going to be sufficient because we've got these finite minds. However, the Trinity is essential to our faith. It's essential to Christianity. In fact, did you know Christianity is the only religious faith that believes in the Trinity of God? There are no others. Now, some people say, well, I got you. I got you, Pastor. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Is it? No. It's not found in the Bible. But neither is the word omnipresence. Do you believe that God is everywhere all at the same time? The word there, that, that's not in the Bible. That word's not there. Or how about uh, omniscient? God knows everything about everybody, every situation. He knows everything. Do you believe that God knows everything? God is omnipotent. When I was pastoring my first church, I mispronounced that name. And I looked out in the congregation, and there was Robin. And I was talking about that God is omnipotent. And the whole, every time I said omnipotent, she was going. <laughs> you know, there's, when the Holy Spirit doesn't get me, Robin does. He's omnipotent, which means, which means he's all-powerful. Do you believe that God is all-powerful? Yeah. Of course we believe that. But the Bible, even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, it is absolutely flooded with descriptions of the triune God and depictions of the triune God. We see it throughout Scripture. And I'm going to show you that this morning. Three things I want to share with you very quickly. First of all, the Trinity is, in fact, a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery, which simply means we can never fully know God. But that, that's a statement of fact. But does that excuse us? We say, well, we can never fully know God, so I won't even try. No. Most of you remember T.W. Hunt, one of the most godly men I've ever known in my life. And his favorite song was, God, I want to know you more. To his dying day, he said, God, I want to know you more. I want to know you more deeply. He didn't know God all the way, but he had that hunger and that thirst in his life to know him in a deeper way. So here's the example for us in the Bible, and T.W. gave us a great example too. We're supposed to spend our life exploring God, trying to understand him, ever learning about God. Uh, and it's going to be impossible, I'll say that, to completely know him because we got this limited mind trying to understand an unlimited God. Someone said God is incomprehensible. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is infinite. He's unlimited. And he is beyond human logic. John Wesley said, bring me a worm that can comprehend man, and I'll bring you a man 
that can comprehend the triune God. Sort of a hyperbole, an exaggeration that a worm can never understand a man, and a man can never understand God. So why is the doctrine of the Trinity so hard? Why is it so difficult? Let me share with you a couple of reasons why I believe it is. First of all, we struggle with the concept of infinity. Were any of you weird kids? I was kind of a weird kid. There you go. You got one honest person here other than me. I was a weird kid. Sometimes I would lay on the grass in the backyard and I would look up at the sky and I would think, I wonder where, where it ends. What's behind the sky? What's beyond what I can see? And my little mind, my young mind, I, I could not begin to understand that the sky goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. There's no beginning and there's no end. It's just, there it is. And in our finite minds as believers, as Christians, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around the thing that there's no beginning to God and there's no end to God. He's always been. We said, well, why in the world is, is that so hard? Because we are prisoners of time. We measure time with birthdays, don't we? You might say, like for instance, my birthday is December the 21st. If anybody wants to buy me a gift, I'll be turning 48 that day. <laughs> but we say, well, I'm this old, and then next year I'll be that old, and Lord good. It gives me grace. I'll live another year. I'll be that old. We, we kind of measure time with our birthdays. And, and if you're married, you might measure it with anniversaries. And when your wife says to you, men, how long have we been married? What you do is you just look at her and say, well, you tell me. <laughs> I know. You tell me. But that's the way we marry, measure our, our married life. You know, we measure it by our anniversaries or, or the holidays coming up, whether it be Easter or Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever it might be. We, we measure life that way. Seasons. Aren't you loving this season right now? I mean, I said, yeah, I, I told uh, Larry on the way over here, I said, uh, you know, we got an extra hour of sleep. It's absolutely gorgeous weather. There's no excuse for somebody not to be in church this morning, get up and come to church. It's a beautiful day. Amen? Amen. There you go. Y'all want to get out early, don't you? <laughs> we wake up in the morning. We say, oh, what am I going to do today? And then we think about what we got to do that night. And we just, we're, we're creatures of time. We're forced into this thing called time. But here's God who has no limits on time. Because there's no beginning and there's no end. The reason we struggle with the Trinity and the concept of the Trinity is because there's nothing else to compare it to. There's not. You see, we got other things we can compare. We can say, well, the greatest quarterback ever was so-and-so. But how do you determine that? You compare him to other quarterbacks, right? The greatest actor there's ever been was so-and-so. How do you determine that? Because you compare them and their acting ability to other actors. Or, or you might say, the greatest singer ever was Marty Richardson. But how do you know that? You compare him. You compare him to somebody else, and you draw that conclusion. But let me ask you this. Who can you compare to God? No one. Isaiah tells us that. It's, he says, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? He said, there's no one that compares to God. There's no one even like God. That person, that being does not exist. So there's no way to compare God, the Trinity, to anything or anyone else. In fact, Augustine was walking down the beach one day and he was thinking about the Trinity. And he saw a young boy that had dug a pretty good sized hole and he noticed as he was walking up toward him, the boy had a bucket. He was dipping water out of the ocean and then going to the hole and pouring it in there. And he was going back and forth. And so when Augustine got close enough, he said, son, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm trying to empty the ocean into this hole. Kind of a good illustration for all of us to think about. We're never going to be able to understand God because it's trying to, like trying to pour a whole ocean of knowledge into our finite minds. And you just can't do it. Someone said, define the Trinity and you'll lose your mind. Deny the Trinity and you'll lose your soul. Here's the second thing. The Trinity is awe-inspiring, A-W-E. The Trinity is awe-inspiring. 
Now, again, the doctrine of the Trinity is distinctly Christian. It sets us apart from all other religions. So you've got to keep that in mind. Here's what the Bible says. God is the one and only. In Isaiah 45, it says, I am the Lord and there is no other. How many others are there? None. None. There is no other. There is no God besides me. So there's no other God. He's the one and only. And it leads us to another thought. God is three in one. He's one God, but the Bible bears out that he has three very distinct personalities. So it makes us think like God must be three. There must be three gods. But here's our error. We're using the wrong equation. Here's what we do. We think about God with three personalities. One plus one plus one equals what? It's not a trick question. <laughs> one plus one plus one equals three. See, the equation we have to use when we think about the Trinity is one times one times one is one. good. It's one. It's one. So God is three, yet at the same time he is one. Have you ever gone into your bedroom or whatever or some room in your house and you measure, maybe you got to buy a certain amount of paint to paint that particular room and you got to know how many square feet it is. And so you measure the height, the length, and the depth. And then what do you do? You multiply that and you get the square footage of that particular room. Well, you don't add them up once you, you measure those three dimensions. You don't add those things. You multiply them. And even though it represents three very distinct parts. It still makes how many rooms? One room. Now think of the word, the Hebrew word Elohim. What does the word Elohim mean? Anybody know? Some of you know, you're just afraid to say. Right. It means God, but actually it means God's plural. Let me illustrate this for you. Have you ever heard of a cherubim? Have you ever heard of a cherub? If you see a cherub, how many cherubs is that? Or if I look around, I say, I see cherubim. Then I'm talking about, I see many cherubs. So you have the singular, then you have the plural. So El is God. E-L is God, and Elohim is God's plural. Why is that important? Listen to these verses in Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, he's using the word our. Our. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God right here is referring to himself in the plural, right? Our image. In Genesis 1, 27. So God, Elohim, created man in his singular own image. So God... And there's the plural, Elohim, created man in his own image, and the word own would ind indicate to us singular. So once again, we see God referring to himself in the plural and in the singular. Isaiah 6, 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I, plural or singular? Singular. Whom shall I, singular, send, and who will go for us. What's the word us? Plural. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, he's three distinct personalities, yet at the same time, he's still just one God. When two people get married, they become one, right? Sometimes I have people say, well, there's the preacher that married us. Let me tell you something. There's never been a preacher in the history of the world that's ever married anyone. All we do is a ceremony. That's it. Only God has the authority and the power to take two people and make them into one. So two people can make one marriage. Now there are a lot of poor illustrations that we've heard throughout the years. One would be this. Here's a man. And that one man is a father and a lawyer and a son. That would indicate that God is one person playing three parts. Like a man could be one person but playing three parts. Father lawyer, son. That's not a good illustration because God is not one person playing three parts. That's a heresy called, and you can look this up, study it for yourself, called modalism. M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M. -S modalism. Very interesting. Some people believe that there's just one God, but he plays three different parts. Well, here's the thing. He is one God, 
in three separate persons. Not three separate parts, but he's one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in three separate persons. He is one in his essence, three in his personality and in his persons. So each of these persons is God. What do you mean by that? Each member of the Trinity is fully God completely. Now help me out. Is God the Father God? Is God the Son God? Is God the Holy Spirit God? So they're completely, totally, fully God. Each personality, each person is fully God. All of them have divine attributes as well. They're all omnipresent. They're all omnipotent. They're all omniscient. They all know all things. They're all infinitely wise. They're all infinitely loving. They're all infinitely holy. All of those things. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three are all of the things that I just mentioned. So is the Lord God and the Lord Jesus and the Lord Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Yes. They're all the Lord, right? Sometimes we just think about Jesus being Lord, but God's Lord, amen? And the Holy Spirit is Lord, and Jesus is Lord. So here's the last thing. The Trinity cares for us. The Trinity cares for us. Now, here you go. Here's what some of you are thinking. I can see it in your eyes. Pastor, why isn't understanding this just for preachers and professors? Why does it matter to me? Why should I understand this? You're going to see. One of the things the church has been charged with is what we call the Great Commission, right? Did you know without the Trinity, the Great Commission is an impossibility? You can't do it. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. So what is that saying to us? That God chose us in Him before the foundations of the world. Before you were ever born, your parents were ever born, your great-grandparents were ever born, your great-great-great-great-grandparents were ever born, God chose you. He chose me. So that's one aspect of it. Here's another, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So God chose us before the foundation of the world, but it was Jesus who left heaven in all of his glory and came to earth and died for us, right? God chose us, but Jesus died for us. Now Ephesians chapter 1 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit applied our salvation. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Our heart. Now think about it again. God chose us before the foundation of the earth. Jesus came and died on the cross for us, and the Holy Spirit applied the salvation of God and sealed it in our hearts. Get it again. The Father chose you, the Son bought you, and the Spirit sealed you. I, I find a lot of comfort in that, do you? Because if I've been born again, if I've truly been saved, here's what it's saying to me. That when I got saved, I was put in the hands of Jesus. And around the hand of Jesus is the hand of the Holy Spirit. And around the hand of the Holy Spirit is the hand of God. In order for me to ever lose my salvation, Satan would have to be strong enough to pry open the hand of God, to pry open the hand of the Holy Spirit, to pry open the hand of Jesus to get to me. Now let me ask you something. Is Satan that strong? No, he's not. I can stray from God. I can break fellowship with God. But once I've been born again, I can never break relationship with him. So why does all this matter to you? Why does it matter to me? Let me ask you this. When you come to worship, do you want to deepen your worship with God? That's a question. Yeah. Then deepen your understanding of God. When you begin to deepen your understanding of God, your worship's going to come alive. You won't be doing like, I wonder what time he's going to quit. Are we going to beat the Methodists to lunch? Man, you, you, you love being here. 
You'll be excited about being here. You'll be praising the Lord. I got to be honest with you, it bothers me when I see people and the expressions on their face and they're just sitting there like a bump on a log during the song service. They're just, they're not responding. They're just standing there. They're not doing anything. Friends, why have you come this morning? Have you come to worship God? Then worship Him. Amen. (laughs) Worship Him. Let me ask you another question. Do you want to deepen your prayer life? You get to know God and you start praying, you will feel in your heart that God will incline His ear toward you. Like the psalmist said, that God inclines His ear toward me. In other words, He's saying God pays attention. And so when you begin to pray, you know that you've got the heart of God and the ear of God. He's listening to you. He's hanging on to every word. How can that happen in your life? How do you sense that? How do you know that? How do you feel that? Because you've deepened your walk with God. You're you're getting in the Word and you're trying to understand Him and you're praying like you're supposed to. And you're living like you're supposed to. And then all of a sudden your prayer life is not boring and mundane and you don't just give a quick little breath of a prayer as you go to bed at night, but you spend some time in prayer and you don't even realize how much time because you're walking with God. Let me ask you another question. Do you want to deepen your appreciation for your own salvation? Then deepen your walk with God because the more you walk with God, the more you're going to understand just how bad we are and how good God is. God's good, amen? One other question. Do you want to deepen your knowledge of Scripture? The more you dig into the Word of God, the more you understand God, the more you're going to fall in love with His Word. It won't be boring for you to open it up and read it. That's God's love letter from heaven itself to your heart. And God's got something to say. If God's got something to say, I want to hear it, do you?